Attention, calling all antique collectors and treasure hunters. We are announcing a sale of curious goods. Everything must go. A Friday Thirteenth podcast. Fester, your host. <laughs> for feature, for, listen, your hosts. Feature your hosts. Featuring. <laughs> Featuring your hosts and sales personnel, David Lawler and Brian Knox. This needs approval. Now, this week's <laughs> special. Uh, um, the poison pen, including a creepy, well, poison pen. Um, how's it going there? I was trying to read uh, my lovely my wife's handwriting lovely is, handwriting. Here. My handwriting is not that bad. You're out of your mind. Hi, I'm it's, Brownwood Knox, the one with the bad handwriting. The bad handwriting. That's why I print. My notes are all in print, so we can see. As Ooh, we can, th- this is a, a big raven. Or is it a crow? I'm it not, could be a crow. It could be a raven. I'm not too good at. This telling. is the Eternal Brotherhood, and this episode is called the Poison Pen. Uh, Ryan, Ryan and Mickey pose as monks to find a cursed pen. This is like an episode of Barnaby Jones. How can P- Mickey pass for for a man? We'll find out. Uh, Colin Fox is the uh, the resident bad guy in this, and I did a little research. There he is now. Uh, he has been in everything. He was even in an episode of Law and Order. I believe he's in. How many episodes of this series does he end up being in? He was in three episodes. He was in. Heads I Live, Tales You Die, which was one of my personal favorites. It's an episode where Mickey dies and then is brought back to life. And um, and then in the third episode was The Butcher, where he plays a Nazi guy. A Nazi, Nazi guy. guy. <laughs> Nazi guy. I like that. That's good. He was like an enemy of Jack Strong. Jack also served in the war because he's done everything, this guy. Um, so we're starting out here in the monastery instead of starting out with our uh, main characters. We have the introduction of the uh, cursed quill pen here. And then we have this guy who loves birds. And he's writing... Even pigeons, apparently. This is kind of unintentionally funny because he dies the way Wiley Co- Coyote dies. Which is, cartoon characters seem to not understand that they can't fly and then when they realize they can't they suddenly fall <laughs> and then you hear see a trail of dust but he is flying he's floating no one um it's a very nice gonna, he's wearing no one else is going to witness this extraordinary event yeah this is uh there he goes well you know for the uh for 1987 it's like wait monks can't fly ah pseudo cgi it's not a terrible effect yeah Splat. I wonder if he bounced or if he splatted. What do you think, huh? <laughs> Probably more of a splat. Oh. He landed on one of the um, the iron uh, patio uh, furniture pieces there. Probably a table. <laughs> There's Curious Goods. And Funeral Brothers Hardware is the name of the hardware store. So this is time they're going to find their... The object that they're looking for via a story in the paper that doesn't that look seems... like a New York Post though? I don't know. Um, so last week, where are you going? <laughs> okay, so last week we sort of indirectly wow. talked about the premise of the show, but do you want to say it a little bit more clearly and specifically? What's indirectly the premise of the show? The pre- le- No, we said last week we sort of vaguely <laughs> talked around the premise of the show, but do you want to like lay it out a little more clearly? Well, uh, um, um, Louis Wanderdee made a deal with the devil to sell cursed antiques. Right. Right. And then what happened? But he broke the pact, and it cost him his soul. Now his niece, <laughs> Mickey, and her cousin, Ryan, have to find all the stuff that he um, he sold, which he really didn't sell as much because he kept a lot of stuff in the vault, which leads me to believe there's Mickey with her wonderful hair. It's time for the Roby Hair Watch. What do we think? So soon? Well, we have to do it now because, you know, she dresses as a man later. Oh. She oh. goes all gentle on everybody. Yeah, it looks good. It's very fluffy. She's got some nice big hair. Going there. So, so yeah, they uh, sometimes they stumble onto um, a cursed object of the week that they're looking for. This episode is a lot better lit because you can see at least more of the inner inner area of the antique store. It's very nice. There's a Chinese it's lantern true, yeah. there by Jack's desk that we we just watched the uh, Cupid's Quiver episode, and it's still there. So, so there's some good continuity in uh, maintaining the set decoration. 
Anyway, you keep cutting me off. They're His finding, notes look like your notes. <laughs> stop. They're finding out about what they're looking for by a, a newspaper headline. That happens a few times, I think. I just don't understand this oracle of death thing striking again and why cops don't seem to be interested, and only these three are ever interested in this kind of stuff. The cops just don't can't figure out what's going on, man. Where did I mean, the journalists come from who wrote the story about the Oracle <laughs> of Death? I'd want to know a little bit more about that. You know how journalists are. They say some crazy things. Make it sound like it's some kind of serial killer. So Jack is going to write up something official looking on parchment that declares that Mickey and Ryan are monks. Simon and Matthew. Sure, that'll be right? completely believable. It's it's only believable to some extent. Not. I mean, even all. even really, it's Brian is even hard to buy as a monk. Never mind about. He's maybe. a monk who listens to the Clash. <laughs> yeah. We rock the Casbah over here. Mickey, what did they do with all her hair? Yeah, that must I mean, have yeah, taken a while. They're strapping down her bosom, but let's talk about how they got all her hair under control for just a second. This is the um, the. They have it uh, in a French braid that that. Um, I mean, who the did Princess that Leia um, method of strapping down breasts. Yeah. So here they are getting into their. He's getting a little handsy with her. Monk costumes. She's like, lay off, lay off, Ryan. W- wouldn't it have made more sense to have Jack and Ryan go as monks, or am I well, crazy? Again, Jack joins them later, but we have yeah. to get all three of them in on the action. Also. Um, this uh, Jack has his official Catholic parchment. <laughs> they have some nice bookshelves back there. This is wonderful. I hope the mic's picking this up. What? Oh. The cat in the litter box. Yeah, it's always got to be something with this. So, <clears throat> we forgot to mention we had to restart our recording last time because right at the beginning, Regan flushed the toilet and it could be heard. That was a lot of fun. Um, so apparently this guy bought it. Even though, I mean, does, does, does Mickey look like a boy? Um, I, no, I mean, I can't separate myself from the fact that I know that it's Mickey. I can't convince myself. It's sort of like, you know... Those, They're cleaning the blood off. There. It's like when you watch those Shakespeare plays um, where... like Taming of the Shrew, Much Ado About Nothing. No, not Taming of the Shrew or Much Ado About Nothing. But, for example, The Merchant of Venice where Portia dress up as a boy. The audience knows it's a girl, and that's the, the thing here. The audience who's been watching knows that she's Mickey, but the characters aren't supposed to know. I don't know. I would think there was something weird about her, like in that weird kind of way that you know Jay Davidson isn't uh, a girl. Because <laughs> she's think- got enormous knuckles on her enormous hands with uh, an Adam's apple. They're just convincing herself she's very young. Oh, she must be... I mean, he must be 15 or something. That's why he looks so clean and smooth shaven. Oh, there's a monk there flagellating himself. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think that's... I, they do not... They never explicitly come out and say that these are Catholics because this kind of stuff, you know, I think the Catholics would have a problem with. This, you, is, this is the Da Vinci Code version of this kind of stuff. Do you know anything about this location where they're shooting? It's very nice. It looks like a real I monastery. believe it was shot on a, on a real vineyard. I know that because you told me later... That these guys make, they, they make wine. Yeah, they refer to it in the dialogue. I wanted to say earlier in the conversation that Jack was having with them, he uh, tells them about Notre Dame and the ability to see into the future, and they're like, Notre who? And he's like, Notre Dame, what's wrong with you kids? Um, and Mickey's a fatalist. She thinks everything happens for a reason and doesn't really believe in the supernatural, which is so strange because weird stuff happens. I mean, I was going to say also that, yeah, this is a real, I mean, it's it's more than obvious that this is a real location. This is not a soundstage, because look at it. It looks real. <laughs> what are those? Um, Actual fixtures, wood. Yeah. Cement. It's very pretty from the outside, and um, these uh, interior shots look really good, too. I'm not sure if someone can correct me, but uh, it also looks a lot like this place where Jack went to meditate in this one particular episode called Wedding Wedding in Black, which is just one of my favorite episodes of the show because it has this real worldly thing going on. All these people come out of Jack's past, uh, Jack, Mickey, and Ryan's past, and basically put them in places where they're trapped, and Mickey is about to be handed away as a bride of Satan. It's fantastic. But the location that he goes to 
looks a lot like this from the outside anyway. They're all trapped in the what? snow globe. That, Do you remember? One of the brothers is eating a bag of peanuts. But I never noticed that before. That's very bizarre. They're having this. They're like having like a prayer time here. They're it all around like the It looks like a slate. Jedi funeral. And the guy, there's a guy who's just sitting there eating a bag of peanuts or popcorn. Is that him right there? No. That's the um, the main bad guy there coming around the corner there. Yeah. He has, he's also done an, a, a lot of voiceover work because he has a great voice. So why would you put some notes here about Mancuso? Is this, did we read this or should I read this? Um, that was from the Elise Wax book. Basically just some notes about when he was first offered the show. Um, I don't know if we did talk about this, this last week. He was offered the show... Frank, Frank Mancuso Jr. was offered the show to do a some kind of show that was called Friday the 13th. That's all that mattered. And it could be about anything. And it could be about anything. He didn't want to do a show about the movie series. It could have been a treatise on all the restaurants he loved. Right. As long as he called it Friday the 13th series. So he, they came up with the idea to do an anthology show, and it eventually developed into um, to what we have. That's the great thing about this. It is an anthology, but it also has a ma maintains a story arc. We, we mentioned that in the previous episode. Yeah, I think we did. But there is no dimension of a denomination in this uh, strange monastery. This guy here, this other guy that's kind of the like the boss of the the guy who keeps bossing them around, um, the worried monk. Richard Libertini passing by there. He looks like John Hurd. He, re he resembles John Hurd. You know, and John Hurd from Heaven Help Us. He mm -hmm. also played a brother in that. And John Hurd, we just watched in another movie too. What was it? We just watched him in something. We know he's the bartender in After Hours. He's the dad in Home Alone. But we just saw him in something else recently. Yeah, um, Cat People. Cat People, that's right. Which, I love that movie. You're not a fan, but... No, sorry, I find that, that one tough to take. But you're not a fan <laughs> of the original, either. No. Look at this guy with the beard and the glasses. They're following him. Do the they have a menorah there? Is him. there a menorah back there? Because then that would be even more confusing. Can I have a sip of that? This is, that? is um, yeah. This is a multi-denominational monastery. So is that what you're saying? It's salsa. Wow, this is amazing oh, it's inside. It's so gothic looking. Nice cobwebs. That's an, yeah, it's a great touch. Whoa, check this out. What are we looking at? Turn the camera. Oh. Well, that's just where Dr. Frankenstein does his little experiments. Yeah, it really does look like that quite a bit. I just wrote that these monks are very trusting. Mickey complains very loudly. Ryan rationalizes. That guy there is the one I think. No, I know he's not John Hurt, but he just looks like, oh, there's a skeleton. Yeah, see this place. Oh, don't scream, Mickey. I, I have the feeling You're actual, undercover. Actual monasteries are probably clean and skeleton free. Yeah. This is very uh, stagey looking. But you think this, um, you think the, the second hand man, here, the second, the lieutenant or whatever? Yeah, there's yeah. There's two the, guys. The guy who comes down on them. There's Colin Fox and then there's this other old guy and they're both con artists. And that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. This this episode is basically a Scooby-Doo adventure because there's a real estate scam involved in it, right? Right. Okay, now this is, this guy took a vow of silence. Or something. That's the guy you think looks like John Hurd? Mm hmm. When John Hurd got older, yeah, obviously not. The, uh... Nah, not for me. He looks like somebody else. <coughs> There's no uh, Catholic iconography. There's no crucifixes. There are crosses, but crosses are kind of no frills. I think this is the monastery of being a goth. Because of the candles and the spider webs and the skeleton in the basement. <laughs> so we, we have a neighbor who has one of those rotary lawnmowers. Mickey, Mickey and Ryan were sneaking around where they weren't supposed to go, so now they're being forced to do lawn work. And not only that, but Ryan has to use a push mower. Hey, did you want to talk a little bit about John LeMay? John LeMay? 
<laughs> Don't you mean like how we should have talked about him last episode? Yeah, like that. We did a pre-roll episode where we talked about John LeMay's early career, or at least the, a year before he got this gig. And he was in this episode of the new Twilight Zone show from 1985 called Dead Run, which had this incredible cast. It had Steve Railsback, Barry Corbin, Brent Spiner shows up, and John LeMay shows up. But I figured if you listen to the pre-roll, which you should do, and I can annotate this right now, go ahead and link to the pre-roll, and listen to that and give us some views over there, huh? 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 Okay. Was that, so you the point me? is that was his first acting job before? No. No? Oh. Well, remember, we, we talked about that too. His first acting job was New Kids, I think. It was the New Kids starring James Spader and Laurie Laughlin. Ah, yes. And we did talk about that. It right. was directed by Sean Cunningham, who was one of the director of the first Friday the 13th movie. And it was written by Stephen Gyllenhaal, the dad of Jake Gyllenhaal, who was also a director of Homicide episodes, remember? Yes, I do. Didn't remember. he actually, Stephen Gyllenhaal, didn't he actually direct an episode of Homicide that had a little Jake Gyllenhaal in it running Yeah, around? yeah. Right. This guy is going to die. He's going to be He's, crushed by his bed. This bed is so high up that he had to get on a stepladder. Not a, st- a step stool to get up onto his bed. Oh, he was speaking. I guess he doesn't have a vowel of silence. No, that's not the same. Wouldn't it be funny if he had a clapper and he just like <laughs> clapped off the lights? <laughs> Something about this scene reminds me of, um, or the guy in his nightcap, it reminds me of a Christmas carol until the bed starts crushing him and then that. That's actually a pretty good effect. I don't know what they did, if they actually had it on just um, telescoping poles or something. But. So what's going on here basically is the pen, the poison pen, when, the, um, when they write it, they write some ridiculous way that these people die and yes. then the people actually die the way that they wrote it. I don't it. know how you write okay. so eloquently that a man is crushed by his own bed, but there you go. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to make sure I follow the, the premise uh, but this is also the second episode in a row where we have a cursed object that doesn't bestow any particular gift. It doesn't give you anything in return for what it does. So the the point of these deaths is just to scare people out of the monastery, as you said, like Scooby Doo. Yeah, a scare Scooby-Doo them out mystery. so they can <laughs> take. Even though they don't really have legal chain to ownership of the monastery, there are a couple of con artists, from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, I think monks aren't really supposed to be materialistic. This episode was written by Darnford <laughs> That's King. the stereotype, anyway. Directed by Timothy Bond. And the air date was October 5th, 1987. Timothy Bond, I know that name because he directed a bunch of stuff for not only Canadian television, but for Paramount syndication. He directed an episode of Next Generation, and he directed an episode or two of War of the Worlds. He also has a couple of co-writing credits as well. That is a really nice desk. And, and I've mentioned it before. It's a nice office, too. That's why he's, in he's yelling. The head of the monastery is yelling at uh, Ryan. Why didn't they just kick them out instead, but they keep them? Because they were sent by the quote-unquote diocese, or if not. Okay. Uh, Mickey is doing her patented complaining, like she did in the uh, previous episode. With her, her voice, there is might get her outed as a woman. I don't know. Yeah, no, <laughs> she's, she's like, yelling, and these guys <laughs> can't hear them, and she's supposed to have a spell of silence. <laughs> I think Jack is going to show up soon. They are complaining quite a bit, huh? Pretending to be like, shh, shh, be quiet. Calm down. She's mad because she hasn't been able to take a shower. There is that. <laughs> She's kind of a pampered little mm, There's uh, a nice a close up of some, some quill pens, nuts. He's making a, um, a duplicate. A dummy so that they can switch it. Ah, that old trick. I wanted to mention your art. Uh, Bronwyn does the art and she does the artwork and now I've given her a credit because I didn't give her a credit in the previous episode but she's getting one for this one. Oh, 
Thanks. Now that the credits are finally finalized. Mm-hmm. So here's the them working in the in the vineyard. You see all these uh, many many buckets of grapes. So do they sell their wine and then collect they the money? Do. Is that what the deal is? I mean, they sell the wine and then the money. they make the wine. They make the wine and then they sell the wine and the collect w- the grapes. The uh, money would obviously go back to to their chair, whatever charitable organizations. Or maybe they, how about um, like uh, rent or or payments or taxes or they, oh, well, they maybe don't, you don't pay, pay taxes. Well, we don't they know. know. They didn't say they were Catholic or not. They could be Scientologists. I think all... any kind of religious <laughs> charitable organization can be tax can have a tax exempt status. I mean, so they can make a whole bunch of money and not have to pay taxes. Yes. Well, I'm going to start my own religion. I call it the Church of Daveology. Okay. We'll get, we'll put you on an e-meter, and you have to have a certain level of um, thetans or not, or something like that. I'm not really sure. I mean, there's probably a bunch of other details to that that I don't know, but generally speaking... Well, this is Brother Jack, and Brother Jack is eating grapes. Yeah, or something. I, guess I don't he had, think you're supposed to do that. He's also got like a, a nice Irish accent going. As you said, he's the he's the anchor. He's the guy who keeps everything going. And um, when he's not in an episode, his presence is missed, both by the characters and by the people watching the episode. Spiders. This is going to be spiders in a second. <laughs> so, why did it have to be spiders? Spiders are. Um, Spiders are wonderful. Uh, Jack likes them, too. See, this is the other con artist, and they're involved in this whole thing. And he's smoking a cigar like a con artist would. Is that what con artists do? They smoke cigars? They smoke cigars. Have you ever I seen The Sting? That. That's all they ah, do. Yes, okay. Just watch Fair The Sting 2. Uh, uh, I, I had to watch The Sting 2 for my uh, Vintage Cable Box column because it's, it's next up on the list. And it's all just con men and criminals and cops everywhere. These two guys that are working together with the pen are having some kind of uh, dispute, though. It's not all its not all paradise in the world of monks and cursed pens. So he doesn't want to keep he doesn't want to keep killing people. Hmm? When you write with the pen, whatever you write becomes reality. Yes. It, it it kills no well it, unless it kill, oh, only specifics. if it kills somebody yes the specific you mean you of, can't write and I made myself because I was wondering about that he is a con man so why shouldn't he write and then I made a million dollars for no, no reason at all a million dollars popped out of a cabinet the pen is a one trick pony the only thing you could write all down it does with is, kill it people. is how a person dies look 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 oh and my then, god his penmanship but you have to know that so you can only write about creatively killing people. You have to know their actual name. You have to write down their actual name and That's come up with the method of their death. Yes. Brothers Simon and uh, Matthew or whatever. Is it Brother Simon and Matthew? Yes. Or not. Now they're going to kill this guy. He's going to kill this guy. He's going to kill his partner with the guillotine blade first. See again, what kind of strange monastery is this? Or maybe not. Is he going to kill him with the... Because I know that there is a kind of, again, very Warner Brothers cartoon moment later on at, at the end of the episode where uh, the bad guy is dispatched with the guillotine that's right behind him. <laughs> and I was thinking he should be like, it's right behind me, isn't it? Guillotine seemed to be our theme for the week. Was that strange episode? We've been we watching a uh, Man from Uncle episodes, and there was the um, the Virtue Affair. The, the Virtue guy Affair. The who guy calls who himself a... Rope Pierre. Rope has, Pierre. Yeah, yes. He has a tiny little guillotine. I guess he uses for chopping vegetables. <laughs> and he was going to use it to chop Ilya. Nope. Oh. I was reminded of. Um, yeah. See, the pen is somehow forcing his will, so he's laying down and. Robin Hood Men in Tights, where uh, Rabbi Tuckman. He conducts circumcisions with a tiny little guillotine, and he goes, nip the tip. Oh, yes, I remember. <laughs> Flink. All right, there goes the mm, partner. really lost his head on that one. <laughs> uh, Thank you. What kind of shampoo does he use? Head and shoulders? I'm here all week. Are you just making these jokes up? That's one prediction all day. 
Well, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> What's his favorite monkeys movie? Head! <laughs> this guy. Oh my god, is that his body there? Oh, that's so gross. No wonder Mickey can't look. <laughs> I wouldn't want to look at a headless monk. I think I would be kind of fascinated. I mean, what are the chances you're ever going to be in this situation again? Well, for them, it's pretty great. But for most of us, it's highly unusual. We watched some horror movie where they talked about how a de uh, decapitated head can live for uh, like a couple of minutes or something. Yeah. I've heard that one before. Is this the whole Tiki Idol spider thing here? <laughs> Damn you, Tiki Idol. So yeah, Ryan and Mickey are trying to sleep and uh, their death has been written. Lighting seems to be a lot more even here than in the previous episode. The previous episode was really dark. Even with those outdoor shots. Was it or is it just a bad print? I I can't I, I can tell you it's the same what we're looking at is the same. Okay. God created what is he? It looked like he was writing God created oh, here it comes. spiders. So this is more of a tarantula. In That's fact, when that Jack comes in later. He's like, "Oh, you're a pretty little thing." <laughs> they sent a tarantula. What's his name, Boris? To Boris the spider. To kill Simon and Matthew, but since their names are Ryan and Mickey, okay, there was the Brady bunch in Hawaii. The two-parter, mm -hmm. and the the the, the spider is cr slowly crawling up the bed. Oh my god! I was gonna die watching that. I was a kid though. That stuff scared the hell out of me. Yeah, me too. Although I didn't really think they were gonna kill him, the Brady kids. Not really. This is really awesome. I like this scene though. <laughs> she can't even. She can't even like scream. <laughs> Have you ever been so paralyzed with fear you couldn't even say anything? Uh, probably. I yeah. nothing comes to mind at the moment. The <laughs> he's crawling on his foot. Doesn't seem to be bothering Jack. They're supposed to be harmless, actually. From what I understand, they're just like scorpions. The bigger they are, the less dangerous they are. The smaller they are. Is, um, is Mickey wearing granny panties? <laughs> I, that's her. Um, un, it goes under my monk robes clothing. She doesn't really get to be a fashion plate in this episode because of the... Uh, Although she gets a nude scene, thing. though, which is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, she really hates brown rice, and I do too. Brown rice is one of the worst things ever in the history of food. It's good for you. It's low-protein gruel that's designed to break your spirit. That's what they give what? you in cults. Stop. It's good for you to it eat may as be a good side for dish. You. As a side dish with a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. <laughs> Don't just sit there eating brown rice. Only a psychotic person would do that. I'm going to bring a bunch of angry people <laughs> sending me comments. I eat brown rice all the time. Yeah. Am I psychotic? I'll kill your whole family if you call me psychotic. You think that guy looks like John Hurt? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. He's not <laughs> quite as good looking. No, that's true. <laughs> He's trying to figure out why they're alive. And it's it, there's a funny little thing here, actually. There's a nice little character moment where somebody... Or I think he, um, I think his, his, uh, his lackey there tells him, Brother Simon and Matthew just inexplicably died um, where they were. And, and then he giggles to himself. He's like, oh my goodness. So they actually, they think that if she doesn't have lipstick and eyeshadow on, that she's, she's a boy, she's a boy yeah, miraculously. Yeah. They should have put glasses on her. You know, like they did with Barbara Streisand. They must have shot this on a real vineyard. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. He, um, so he has the idea that since they're not dead... They're obviously not who they say they are. And apparently, this pen needs the proper identification. Yeah, I said that earlier. They right. need, it needs to have their real names. 
It needs an actual ID card, maybe two forms of ID. I don't and know. Okay. A proof of address. I didn't say that. Like a utility <laughs> bill or something. Just a utility bill. I don't. Is the guy, um, the uptight guy, the, young, the guy that I think looks like John Hurt, is he in on this too? No. He didn't seem to be. I don't think he is, no. He killed his partner. That guy, he killed his partner with the guillotine. Yeah. This guy is just uh, trying to do his job. He's just trying to do his, what's right. He's just the like taskmaster of the monastery. Yeah. Now he's being interviewed because of all the deaths. Here's all the press. What happened exactly what happened. Please! How did he die? This foul play suspected in the death of the order. Boy, this is back when journalism was for real, man. These people got up all in your face. Brother Curry was a man loved by all here. He's brother. reading a statement. His gift of predicting the future. Did he predict his own death? His gift became his... Did they get, like, real actors, or is this just the crew? They just dressed up the crew. Is that the costume designer? Take his own life rather than suffer any longer. Okay, not John Hurd. The actor... <coughs> the actor that was in Blade Runner. Blade Runner. That was... Um, telling... He was having Deckard interview... Uh, M.M. at Walsh? Yes. You think he looks like M.M. Walsh? Yes. You mean the guy from Fletch? Yes. The doctor? Uh-huh. Arnold Babar. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Moon River. Thank you, Doc. You ever served time? Mm. Ah, using a whole fist there, Doc. Jack's doing He's his... He's searching um, for the pen. He's, um, I think maybe Jack was also a burglar. Oh! <laughs> But he's done everything. We watched the Cupid's Quiver episode, and he's like a bartender. Maybe we can find uh, his he's bio a for next time. Jack's serious bio for next he's time. He's a lockpick. He knows he's a magician. He's an expert on the occult. He knows how to use the library. <laughs> Was that you were saying? <laughs> we were oh. watching, okay, we watched Suspiria last night, and they kept saying occult, occult, right? Occult. Something weird like that, yeah. Because I guess they were being dubbed. And they were European actors. No, he's matching hand. He's a handwriting analysis, too. Analyst, yes. Uh, you know what? If you live that long, you can accumulate a lot of skills if you don't spend all your time. Well, that's just the way it was. <laughs> on the internet, huh? They're yeah. older generation. The, uh, the silent generation, if you will. They did a lot of things. The silent generation? I don't know. I never heard that one before. No, that's... He's spying. And then later he's going to be spying right here on Mickey in the shower. Nice water pressure. What, she snuck off to like find the five minutes a day when there's no monks in the shower so she could get Well, clean. Ryan's looking out, keeping a watch. <laughs> I wonder, he must be really confused now. <laughs> I, and let, look, he couldn't be confused. I think he, he should be just... No, I don't know that much about women, but I'm pretty sure that's not a man. He's ob obviously not a guy. Well, we can do uh, the Roby bra watch, I guess, because she's not wearing a bra. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Roby bra watch, yeah. Yeah, these are not circumstances where she can wear a bra. Actually, it really doesn't matter if she just if she ties her breast down because she's wearing the billowing gown anyway, right? No one's going to see her boobs. They might. Why take your chances? It's all loose clothing over here. Only this guy is wearing something that's not left to the imagination. <laughs> this is when he... Is this when he, he laughs? Oh, it's time for Vespers, I guess. Hmm. We got dead air here. Talk, people. <laughs> we got to talk. Got to stay active. Uh, Jack tries to hide. It doesn't really work out. No, he's trying That's a to. Nice, is that a desk or an altar? It's a writing table. He's still trying to find the pen while they're off having their ceremony, but he's about to get caught by the villain. Well, the jig is up because he pulls a gun on him, which is like the most unimaginative thing you can do. 
It's not very, uh, it's not very holy. I thought you were meditating, but I am premeditating. Premeditating, that's cute. Shouldn't you be meditating? No, I'm premeditating. Pre-medita- oh, that's such a bad joke. That's a bad pun. It's very. So, um, what do you think of this episode? Napoleon like- Solo, James Bond. Yeah. Well, Roger Moore, I guess. Um, it's an okay episode. Uh, I feel like it should have come a little bit later in the season because I feel like they're still working through their characters. There's there's more they could have done. Um, it was probably I. They did episodes later where they would leave one member of the team because you asked the question yesterday. Was it you or was it Regan? Uh, one of you asked, what happens if they all die? What happens? I mean, like, they, they're the only ones who know about this mission. They're the only ones who know about the cursed objects. So I figured later in the show, you would have them in separate places. Someone would be minding the store and the other two would be out on the adventure. So that there's a, be someone left alive in case... Uh, in case something goes on. And the thing is, we're talking hmm. about a, a monastery here. Mickey should have stayed at home, and Jack should have gone with Ryan. Well, yeah, that's what I was but saying But otherwise, earlier. unless they were doing this for comic effect of her just uh, being generally pissed off at having to be a, a boy. I mean, that's... Um, I don't know about comic effect. For some reason, it's easier to get comic effect about a guy dressing as a girl than the other way around. Yeah, they should have had Brian dressing as a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some reason. Now that Ryan, I'd pay to see. Ryan and Jack if as Ryan Monty Python. dressed as a nun, then you would have nuns on they the They could run. be like John Cleese with stockings in a suit. I don't know why. I don't know why that's the comedy thing, but probably less so now. But um, Well, we don't do that. Yentl was yeah. meant to be drama. Tootsie is meant to be comedy. Get it? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, he's making his So, yeah, I mean, I, when uh, all the times I've watched these... Uh, Connor, watch this series with you. I think I always forget about this episode. Not because it's bad. It's not bad. I just, um, for some reason, it doesn't stand out other than, oh, this is the one it's where not Mickey a bad dresses episode. as a boy. Yeah, yeah, it's not a boy. It's not a bad episode. But I think part of the thing that gets interesting in the other episodes is you are more interested, you become interested in the person who has the cursed object and their reason for why they want it. And I think maybe this isn't the most interesting reason that he wants an object. He just wants um, to uh, trick some people out of money by making them think that there's something, some curse I, on them. It's obvious on the vineyard. Hmm? It's obviously a supernatural undercurrent current to the power of the pen itself. But right. this is basically just a Scooby Doo adventure with a real estate scam <clears throat> and pretending to be an owner. Yeah, some of the future episodes have more of an emotional impact as far as the cursed object on the character. Yeah, I mean, well, the next episode, Cupid's Quiver, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, 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 We'll get to it when we get to it, but it, again, the motivations of the cursed object and the people who use it still confuse me. I don't think they had it down yet. Maybe in the next episode. The next episode is that cup one. I think the cup one does something for you. You have to do well, something for Well, I mean, I think the it. Cupid's Quiver has some interesting things going on, but yes, we can talk about that next time. Here, enjoy these lamps, huh? I love lamps. <laughs> I've gotten really big on lamps. Lamps in the color green. Every, why is this pen so hard to find? I feel like every because it's search. small. Don't you get it? Also, it's yeah, a writing it's desk. A Everybody has it. pens everywhere, and they're probably not permitted to use Bic or ballpoint or anything like that, right? Oh come on! They probably all have to use quills. We should probably make some Jeffrey Rush jokes. <laughs> well, is this it here? It's awfully pretty. It's just, is it, I don't understand, it because when you, when you, when you draw or, or write with a quill pen, you're writing with the tip of the feather. Yes. So what is that silver portion for? Is that just to hold it in a nice decorative little thingy? Well, I think. Uh, and also, is the quill itself cursed, or is it the silver thingy that's cursed? I don't think that they're actually writing with a feather with this particular pen. There's a nib. So I feel like the feather is, it's just sort of designed like you would if you were actually writing with a feather, but it, but they're actually writing with a metal nib on this particular pen. Like if you, and if you, you went out and bought, n- there's a metal nib and you if you went point? out and bought, yes. So it's not really about the feather tip. Where's the ink also? You dip. You have to dip. You the, still have to dip uh-huh, it? You have to dip it. Why well, don't get the nib? What it's do you mean when you say nib? Because you can buy different sizes. I'm just nibs thinking about the sharp pen. point of a quill that you 
turn the yeah, they're not. It's not actually what they're. This is more modern than that. This isn't actually drawing with a feather. There is actually. And it's not a fountain pen either. A fountain pen, you, you suck up the ink with the little thingy, and then you use the little. Tip no, of it. there's a nib to the quill pen. You dip it. It's designed like a feather, and it's got the feather end, but it isn't a feather that you're writing with. And you dip the nib into the ink, and then you rats. write or draw. No, rats. Rats. <laughs> Jack's about to bite it here. <laughs> don't move. He said, "Don't move to him." Yeah, that doesn't Did he really... say, uh, Jack, don't move. <laughs> yeah, please stay there and let, yeah, let the guillotine take, guillotine take your head off. How am I supposed... He should, he should have smacked him back in the head and he said, don't move. <laughs> That's cute. A little joke there by Jack. That was actually a funny joke. <laughs> Pens everywhere. This Mickey is the, found the pen. She's so pleased with herself. <laughs> this is the first episode of uh, about a pen. The second episode appeared in the third season called Mightier Than the Sword, which is cute. Mm-hmm. And that's a pen. That pen does have a symbiotic use because the writer in that, played by Colm Fior, is he's a best-selling novelist or something. He writes about serial killers, but he creates them with the pen, basically. Okay. He turns Mickey into almost a serial killer. So that's not... I mean, it's still creating something with a pen. It's not that different of an idea. It's giving him uh, talent as a writer. Because it seems like when he holds the pen, it's controlling him to write it. To write the stories. Ah, okay. So it's like possessing him and writing through him. Oh, yeah. Certain death. This has a clever ah! ending. Right? I will be happy to change this to include you as well, Brother Drake. You're going to burn in hell, you traitor! Put that down! Okay, is he going after him with the axe because he's mad or because somebody wrote down that he should kill this guy with an axe? No, no, no. Um, he doesn't, don't you doesn't remember seem there's, like a very monk-like thing to do. To do don't huh? you remember there's a really slick, clever ending to this whole thing? There's a twist. He doesn't realize that he's writing his own death because his oh, right, name right. is on the thing. No, um, yes, I... your boy there, M. M. Walsh, uh, he's coming <laughs> at him because, uh, you know, he's a bad guy. And yeah, really, but even frankly, so, you're not... He should be monk, making friends with an axe. You're not supposed to be killing people with an axe, even if they've done evil things, well, if I mean, you're a monk. On. Uh-oh, see, he put his name, it's on a, it's on a work order. <laughs> okay, the... Guillotine, guillotine blade is now has left the guillotine machine and it's just going after the guy independently. <laughs> he can't believe the monk can't believe it. This is a little. That's not this the is a little cheesy. Effect just a I've little ever bit. seen of the floating just blade here. But then I have a feeling there's no way you could make this look really great, even if you had all the CGI in the world, right? That's true. It's a little silly. It's just a floating blade. Ha ha ha! You thought you would kill me with a guillotine blade. Little do you know, I am faster than that blade. Well, suddenly I sound like a character from Speed Racer over here. Yeah, you do. Well, Santo, I'm glad to see you. See, uh, Moron never turns around, never sees the guillotine blade right there. Uh, You want to check that out there? Behind you. Flink. Ooh. Put him right in the scar. He got him in the scar? <laughs> right in the scar. Where are you? Maybe say some frosties. Peppermint frosty. He should have stuck to pencils. <laughs> what did Brian say? He said he said he should have switched to pencils or something. Oh, he should have stuck to pencil. Ah, yes, that's pretty bad. Yes. Okay. Wait, are we sure we got the right one? Now, is Ryan yeah. wearing pajamas? <laughs> no, he's just wearing a pair of white striped pants, which is something you could do in the 80s. Those look like pajamas. No, they're not. Although he's wearing, he's also wearing dress shoes without socks, which is never a look that uh, I, I that like on the, men. Isn't but... that the Harvard look? Yeah. yeah. How do you know it's the right one? A true artist always knows his own handiwork, my dear. Mm-mm. So you're really and He's sure. dressed like she's ready for her shift at Hula Hands. Only one way to find out. Hmm. Lunch. Let's order something really sinful. Let's not. 
Anyway, what do you think of the episode? No, oh, there's a freeze frame. Um, well, yeah, no, it's just like I said, it doesn't really... It's one that I sort of forget about. It's exciting enough, especially towards the end, but it doesn't have that much of, emotional, of an emotional impact compared to some of the other episodes. All right. Well, um, thank you for listening, and we will be back next week with Cupid's Quiver, directed by Adam Egoyan. Yes, Mama calls him Aton. No, I don't. I said no. A two M. A two M. Egoyan. It's A T O M, not it's Adam. Adam. You keep saying it like Adam. It's Adam. 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 Good night. Good night. Thank you, Doc. You ever serve time?